I hope you all had a cup of coffee or tea so that you're all fully uh, awake. And uh, I have the great honor to introduce our next speaker, Marcella Escobari, who is a executive director at the Harvard University Center of International Development. She has advised governments. Um, she began her career as a banker. It's a very interesting uh, background. And um, I guess I will then leave the floor to you, Marcella, and uh, I'm sure everybody will, will be very concentrated on what you say. Thank you. And lunch. please, a warm applause to Marcella. Thank you. No. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'd, uh, it really has been a privilege to spend the last couple days here. A lot has resonated. Um, but I, um, so this conference has made me think of, 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 of trying to think of that um, defining moment that led to what I believe in um, works in uh, eradicating or fighting poverty. And I think that moment was uh, June 1993. Uh, I was, uh, had just finished my first year uh, from Swarthmore, which was a Quaker school in Pennsylvania. And I was heading back to Bolivia, where I'm from, for the most um, meaningful job I could find, which was um, working with a World Bank project with an indigenous tribe. And, uh, and I found myself in a... Um, this light is very harsh. <laughs> Uh, I found myself in a, in a train ride, in a two-day train ride, which was going to the hinterlands in between the border between Bolivia and Brazil, the middle of nowhere. And I was traveling with this uh, French anthropologist from the World Bank. And she woke me up right uh, before dawn to tell me that we were, uh, we were about to arrive. So I got my backpack, I got ready, and she said, but you know, we're going to an indigenous community, and so the train doesn't really stop there. Um, so we're going to have to jump <laughs> off the train. But don't worry, I've, you know, I've, I've told the conductor to try to slow down, but I'll tell you how to do it. And I've never paid more attention in my life, right? <laughs> and she said, you know, if the train is going in this direction, you jump in the direction that the train is going. Because if you jump against it, the momentum will, might bring you back under the tracks. This might be the only useful thing you get from my talk, so pay attention. <laughs> There's a lot of trains in Switzerland. So I, um, I got, uh, I got to, um, to the village. We arrived alive. And, uh, and we met the Ayurians. This is an indigenous tribe that, uh, that used to be nomadic. They used to be hunters and gatherers. Um, but because of the growth of private farming, they were literally being hunted out of, of, of private farms. And they could no longer be nomadic, so they had settled in communities. This is what the Ayoreans looked like. And, uh, and they had settled in these communities, but because they didn't have the skills needed uh, to survive in sedentary li living, they had become a, a subculture. They'd become the prostitutes and the beggars of the major cities. So the moral imperative of this project was, was, was high. This is where, where the communities were. And so I get to work on my first day, and they say, OK, you, um, you need to help get more kids to school, because only 30% are going, and this is important. And, uh, and I go to the first day of school, and some of the kids are being turned back from the school. And I ask, what's going on? I said, well, the kids need to you know, have shoes to enter school. These kids don't have shoes, so turn back. Half of the kids didn't own shoes, right? These were actually uh, the kids. I, this is a picture I took many years ago. And uh, you enter into the classroom, and um, you know what you saw was the kids parroting what the teacher said. You know, she would say something, they would repeat, and I'm like, okay, that interesting. What's going on? Well, the teachers were Spanish speakers, and the kids spoke Ayurian. So there was not a lot of learning happening in this classroom with the two. Um, so, you know, the World Bank people were trying to figure out a way. They, they tried to give people a source of livelihood, thought maybe they can raise animals. They gave them, you know, cows and, and chickens. And within a month, they had um, eaten the cows and chickens because they were hungry. They brought all the, you know, male elders from the village to try to think about next steps. Well, this village was a matriarchy, so nobody paid attention to the men. You know, I could go on with example after example, but you know, I I um, um, I saw a lot of um, I mean, 
my idealism was crushed that, that summer, realizing that with a lot of good intentions, uh, the possibility of making a difference through this project was, was very slim. It was poorly designed. And as in most failures, I learned a lot. I, I, I saw the perils of many of, of these will intention development projects being a focus on inputs, right? Money, food, housing, uh, schooling versus outputs, right? Are people learning? Are, are people's well-being being improved? Do people have incomes increasing? But I also saw um, a people's deep desire for, 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 for self-sufficiency. And, um, and it made me think differently about, about poverty. How do we define poverty? And if I asked you, like, what, what do we think the poor are missing? And it's a question to you. What, what do you think the poor are missing? The poor are missing many things. What are some things? Tell me. These kids, what are they missing, aside from shoes? Education. Education. What else? Housing. Hope. Housing. Good housing. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Clothes. Clothes. What else? Medical, health care, clean water, right? Um, yeah, there's something, they're missing all those things, but they're also yeah, missing this kind of, there's a lack of, of, of empowerment, of opportunity. And I'd like to think about it as, as, as being disconnected from networks of productivity. And uh, Francesca, I think, talked about this issue of connectedness. Um, but if you think of, uh, of the things that you did today, right? You woke up. You know, you washed up, you had breakfast, you did other things, you like commuted to work, no? And all of these things imply a connection, a connection into real networks like water pipes and an electric grid and electricity, um, but also other more intangible networks like markets, financial markets, um, you know, and, um, and things we can't measure but that allow people um, to increase their well-being. This is where the poor wake up in the morning, right? These are the beds they, uh, they wake up from. This is how they, uh, they get water. This is how they cook breakfast. And this is just a joke how they commute to work, but not really. Um, but they are disconnected. Disconnected from networks of, uh, of, of, of opportunity. And this disconnect has huge implications, not just in their well-being, but in their productivity, right? How productive would all of you be every day if you had to go two hours to get water every day, right? And that's just one, um, one example. So if we think about the differences in productivity, right? This farmer trying to get him to be to this farmer. This farmer has access to know-how, has access to technology, has access to fertilizer, has access, you know, pretty comfortable there, there's air conditioning um, compared to these farmers. And the productivity difference is huge. Like I think, um, an acre of land is five times more productive in the U.S. than in Africa, and a farmer is a hundred times more productive in the U.S. than in uh, than in Africa. And um, and this question of how to decrease this gap is what uh, motivates a lot of the work that uh, that we do. How do we help them catch up? Now, this question of catching up is one that has motivated economists and thinkers, you know, throughout history. I mean, Adam Smith, when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, you know, in 1776, this was what motivated him. He, at the time, you know, he was appalled at the fact that the richest country was four times richer than the poorest country. Who was the richest country at that time, 1776? China. China. No, China, UK, closer. Netherlands. Fran Netherlands. The Netherlands was the richest country, and the poorest? That hasn't changed much. It was uh, Ethiopia. It was in Africa. It was Cote d'Ivoire. And if we think about the poorest countries today, Cote d'Ivoire is still there. The Congo is probably the, 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 the poorest country in the world. And you multiply times four the income per capita. You get to Haiti. Um, we multiply times four and you get to Cape Verde. You multiply times four, you get to Chile. Multiply times four, you get some of the richest countries. And then still there are richer countries. So the richest country today is 145 times richer than the poorest country. And, uh, and, and the question for all of us, I think, is, is, uh, that motivates us is, what is it that our grandchildren are going to see? Right? Is, is that gap going to continue to increase? Are we going to be seeing 300? Or are we going to be managing to find con convergence? 
Um, so what do we know about growth, right? Because obviously it happened in some places. First, uh, that growth did not characterize humanity for the longest time. So basically there was no growth, and then in, la in the last 200 years, there was a huge acceleration. Okay? And when this acceleration happened, uh, it happened in very unequal ways. So this is actually from uh, Madison, Agnes Madison, who's a British uh, um, economist, historian. And you can tell because you know, the US and Canada are Western offshoots, mm -hmm. still taking credit for it. Yeah, but, um, um, but as you can see, this happened, right? And the question is, why did those countries grow so fast? Right? And let's look at one example. The U.S. The U.S. grew, since 1820, uh, 25 times. And not two or three times, it grew 25 times. And the question is, why did it grow 25 times? Because if we understand how they did it, maybe we can um, change it for, for, for many countries stuck in poverty. And uh, uh, here are some answers, and I want you to kind of tell me, nod, if this resonates with you as answers of why countries like the U.S. and other developers grew so much. Number one, that to grow countries need to specialize. Does that resonate with anybody? So-so. That uh, the secret of growth is innovation. I have a lot of social entrepreneurs. Uh, and thus, good schooling. Who can argue with that? And, uh, and that the, the secret lies in adding value to your raw materials. So, a little bit to be facetious, I'm going to argue that this is not the case. There are also a lot of economists and a lot of growth uh, uh, theory relies on factor accumulation. If you just accumulate all these things, land, labor, capital, money, technology, human capital, which is schooling, you will grow. Well, those are all good things, but that has not explained differentials in, in, in growth. And, uh, and then there are others who think, okay, create you know, an enabling environment, a good enabling environment and good things will happen. This was actually um, called, uh, some of you might remember, the Washington Consensus, where a lot of multilaterals in Washington decided all of these things are really good things and every country should do them, and if they take their vitamins, they will grow. And all of them were good. You can summarize them as stabilize, privatize, liberalize, democratize, and many um, did this. Actually, Bolivia was a very good student, where I'm from, and they didn't grow. Not that any of these things were, were wrong, but that was not um, um, what explained uh, growth. So what I'm going to argue is comes from one, some of the work that we're doing at the center is that the U.S. grew because it learned how to make new and better products and found better ways to make them. And not that it was making more of the same things, but it was making different things. Now, who is it that learned how to make these things? None of these products existed, right, in the 1800s. Who learned this? Is this that, you know, you are all kind of in the Western world a little bit smarter than poor people? And, you know, does you learned how to make more complicated things? Well, to answer that question, I'll give you a couple e examples of, let's think of, um, of an Inuit. Compare an Inuit, in your mind, with modern man, right? So this is an Inuit. This is an Inuit finding food. It's an Inuit making its own ha his own housing, making his own modes of transportation. Knows a lot on how to survive in its environment. And compare that to modern man, right? Modern man can't find its food, can't make its own shelter, cannot, you know, um, cannot make the, I mean, except uh, maybe Paul Rose. I think he could make all of these things. Um, but for the rest of us, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's all we got. Um, you know, he can't make those glasses. He can't make the shirt. He can't write a, a, a line of code. For all intents and purposes, you know, modern man is useless. But the difference, <laughs> the, the difference is that in modern society, yes, I did not choose women. Yeah, um, <laughs> purposely, <laughs> it resonates more with the crowd. But, but the difference is that modern man holds a little bit of the knowledge that its society uses. And the Inuit um, holds all of the productive knowledge that that society uses, right? So every Inuit has to learn all the productive knowledge that its society has. While we, in modern societies, have one little bit of expertise that, the wor that our societies manage to bring together through organizations, through firms, through markets. We want to manage to bring that bit of productive knowledge that each of us um, has to make more complex things, right? So, that's the difference. You think about this uh, model of production, 
uh, it's a chicken factory, right? Everybody there holds a bit of knowledge, but they hold the same amount of knowledge and they're pretty interchangeable. And compare that to this, right? Which I think resonates with, um, with you of like, everybody knows something different, but bringing it together, we managed to make something much more complex. All right, um, so you might say, okay, I get it. This is about education, right? We just have to learn more and have more knowledge. And it's not that education is not important. It's hugely Im important, but this is a slightly different concept because when we think about education, we think about the average knowledge that we want our citizens um, to acquire. And what we're talking about here and what creates you know, societies that are able to, make, uh, to prosper is uh, the diversity of knowledge that your society can, uh, can accumulate and the mechanisms to bring that, uh, that knowledge together. So that's the slight difference with education not being uh, you know, that simple. And, and to make this point, let me compare a couple countries, Ghana and Thailand. Ghana and Thailand had a very similar GDP per capita 40, 50 years ago, around $300 per year. Ghana, you know, it's kind of the, the star performer, one of the star performers in Africa, invested a lot in education, it, more than Thailand, and its education is actually in English, so there's a lot of synergies with, with other markets. It has more schooling um, per year through time, um, you know, in the last 50 years. And if we think about what Ghanaians were making in, uh, in you know, the 1960s, this is what they were making. This is kind of like the export basket of Ghana. And you can see they're around, they were making cocoa, chocolate, and some wood products and some metal products, right? And that was around 80% of what they knew how to make. And if you think about how that's changed in, you know, 40 years later, they're still making a lot of cocoa. Maybe they've moved to cocoa butter, still a lot of aluminum and mag manganese, and, uh, and there's a little bit of diversification there of the <coughs> blue part. They can make some, some electronics and whatnot. But they've mostly been making the same things. And this is the trajectory. As you see, all the yellow part is the agricultural products. The brown is, um, is um, uh, mineral products. And actually, Ghana exports today per person less than it exported 40 years ago because that big di dip was a bunch of coup d'etats and, and you know, the crash of cocoa prices and whatnot, and they have not been able to recuperate. So as a people, they have not learned how to make a bunch of different things. Compared, um, let's, uh, let's look at Thailand. Thailand, very similarly, 80% agricultural products in, 19, uh, in, in 1960s, a little bit of diversification, but minerals and ag. And this is what it looks like today, right? All that... Um, light blue is electronics, dark blue is machinery, um, purple is chemicals. Their economy has completely diversified. They have learned to make a bunch of different products. And if you look at the trajectory, it's not that they stopped making agricultural products. They still make more agricultural products than they did 40 years ago, but they learn how to make a bunch of different things. And the question is, how? What happened? Right? And this is thus the trajectory of their growth. Ghana as a star performer in Africa is more or less flat compared to a huge acceleration in, in, uh, in Thailand. So how do we do this? How do societies grow and diversify? And part of, of, of the problem is that a lot of developing countries are stuck in a, um, in a chicken and egg problem, right? Because we would want to do more things. So I would like that there's a biotech industry in Bolivia. So but am I going to become a biotech engineer if there is no industry in the country that's going to hire me? And will there ever be a biotech industry if I don't become a biotech engineer? Um, and we're stuck in this problem of like the capabilities and the know-how doesn't exist and thus, you know, the industry does not exist, but why would there be an incentive to create that knowledge if nothing exists? So we're stuck, right? But you would say, well, but countries have figured this out. Countries have grown. They have diversified. So how is it that they've managed to do that? And what we um, see is that countries move to nearby products. And you're like, what does nearby mean? Um, and let me, le le let me give you a kind of an idea of what this nearby, right? Um, think of a product like shirts for men. Uh, and, uh, and think of another product like shirts for women. And I say, how close 
in the space of nearby are these two products. When the definition of close is um, the shared capabilities. Like if I know how to make shirts for women, how many more much know-how do I need to build to be able to make shirts for women? And if that's not a lot, that's just a little jump, then those are close, okay? So how close are these two? Pretty close, yeah, I don't know, maybe a tailor would say different, but yeah, pretty close. And then if I say, okay, these are here, and how about you know, flat panel televisions? You're like, I don't know where this is, but that's pretty far away from that, right? All right, and if I say computer monitors? I'm like, I don't know where, but probably close to the televisions, right? So, okay, so we got these two places. And then if I say, okay, how about chocolate? You're like, all right, I don't know, but somewhere completely different, right? No, Swiss chocolate is everywhere. <laughs> um, so we actually mapped this. We mapped what we call the product space. And we mapped it with data for 50 years in every country in the world, and everything that they've traded, and we mapped how close were products to each other um, based on the shared capabilities. And this is what we came up with. This is uh, research from Ricardo Hausmann and other at the, at the center. And this is not modern art. This actually is very meaningful for the development uh, uh, problem. And let me tell you what it is. So every little dot in this map is a product. It literally is an actual product. So there's this. So this little cluster over here is garments, the green ones. So this is shirts for men, something is shirts for women, blazers, whatever. This is machinery, this is electronics, this is chemicals. Over here in the periphery you have um, agriculture and oil. Every product is here and it's linked by the probability of co-production through history. So if countries that made shirts for men also made shirts for women, through history, then those two products are gonna be close to each other. So think about this as a forest, okay? Where every uh, node is a tree. And what you want as a society is, um, is to take over this forest. So think of firms, companies, as monkeys. And you want your monkeys to take over the forest because countries that grow diversify, they take over the, the, the forest um, from wherever they start, to nearby distances, because what we know is that firms or you know, places can only jump short distances. Um, so, um, so this map is important because if every node was equidistant from each other, you know, and everything was five meters away, uh, what would that mean for development? It would mean that it was just a matter of time. Eventually your firms will all jump to the next tree and they will take over this uh, um, this forest, but it's not a very homogeneous shape, right? So what it means is that if you are stuck as a country in these products, like agriculture and oil, it's very hard for you to jump to nearby things. There is a path, but you have to be very conscious about it. This is oil. Everybody has heard of the perils of oil, right? There's Dutch disease. Um, but this shows another reason why all countries tend to be poor, because the capabilities that you acquire to make oil, which is you know being able to drill a, a big hole in the ground, and so, are not easily redeployable to other industries. You know what are you going to send in a big tube? You know coffee, but you have to brew it first. Like you know, there's nothing. So whatever you learn stays in that industry, and it's it doesn't give you capabilities that are easily to uh, to um, um, to redeploy for other things. So um, why does this matter? Right? So what we did is an, in an understanding what you make and your, um, your ab where you are in the product space, which is your ability to then move into other things, we created a measure, right? And a measure that we called economic complexity. It's a number that we gave to all the, every country based on what you make and where you are in this product space. And I promise this is the only uh, regression you'll see. But uh, this is every country. Okay, and it measures economic complexity, gives you a number, and income per capita. And that you, you see that there's a clear relationship. The more complex you are, the richer you are, right? Um, so countries tend to converge to the level of complexity. Now, for the economists in the room, they might say, you know what, it's a nice regression, but I've seen kind of cleaner relationships. This is very noisy. There are these countries that are not really on this line. You know, and then, you know, coming from Harvard, I would say, well, either my theory is wrong, our theories, or the world is wrong. 
And of course, I'll say the world is wrong. That hasn't fit quite to our theory. No, but actually, the distance from the line tells you something. So if you are a country like Vietnam down here, I say, you are poorer than I would have expected given how complex you are and the things that you make. And what this means is that we're going to expect India to grow faster in the future. There are other countries up there, like Greece, which are above the line, where I'd be, wow, you are very rich for making yogurt and, you know, <laughs> tourism. No, I'm just kidding. But it, uh, it and, and what we see is that, is that if we look at complexity, you know, this measure 10 years ago, and, and see how countries have grown, we see that countries that we expected to grow that were below the line, like China and Vietnam, grew much faster than we even expected. And countries that could, did not have that complexity end up growing um, um, less. So, uh, I mean, this is interesting in terms of if you're an investor, great, I can tell you which countries are going to grow faster. But we're in the business of trying to figure out how do we help these countries catch up. And this product space and this, uh, and this thinking about know-how and societies bringing that together is one way in which we can help countries understand a very individual path to prosperity. Based on where you are in this product space, um, we can tell you what are the kind of capabilities that can help you get to the, um, um, get to the next potential uh, products and, and, and which ones are likelier to bring more diversification. So anyway, to conclude, this, this, um, uh, this conference has made me think of, as, as the title says, okay, so what does it mean for the rest of us, right? I took you to 1,000 meters above and, 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 and in terms of courage, right? So every, all of us have a role to play in this, um, in this equation. But anyway, before I, before I get to that, I actually wanted to go back to, um, to the wise words, right? Because I told you that these are the things that I said are not true. Um, so to grow, countries need to specialize. So I've, at least I think that one's clear, but no one believed that, 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 that you had to specialize. So to grow, countries need to uh, diversify. Now, if I'd say the secret lies in good schooling, what would you say now? What does it rely on if it's not schooling? What's that? Product innovation, which which happens through, what's that? Connections. Connections, networks, and it's it's getting the diversity of knowledge, right? Versus just schooling is what we're looking for, and that this one's a little bit trickier. Like where I said that um, there's not about is is it about innovation? There's nothing wrong with innovation. We have a bunch of innovators here. But a lot of, uh, 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 of people say, well, developing countries just need to you know, build new things and do the next, uh, uh, the next iPod. Based on this, what would you say? Is it about innovation for many of the poorest countries in the, in the world? What would you say it's about? What's that? Is that, yeah, there's a little bit of that. It's about imitation and doing it well. Right? For many countries, you know, we need to diversify to products that already exist, but maybe you adapt them to the context of your, uh, of your environment. Um, but a lot of the secret of growth for many developing countries is going to rely on imitation. And lastly, that it's not about adding um, value to your raw materials. It's about following your capabilities, what you know how to do. And many countries get get uh, uh, bogged down by thinking that they have to rely solely in, uh, in what they can take out of their ground and just add a little value to that because that is uh, um, it's limiting their potential. And, uh, and, uh, and to finish, as I was saying, what are the roles for, for, for all of us? It, it has made me think of, uh, as we went through these different uh, presentations, right? With this, this one additional view of how to create prosper prosperity. If I think of the role of politicians, they have a hugely important role in building the infrastructure, the networks, connecting the poor, creating the public goods that allow them to be, uh, um, um, to improve their lives. And they also have a huge role in playing in, uh, in letting a thousand flowers bloom, in letting businesses thrive and not get invested um, or or tied to the invested interest and to the businesses that exist right now, but those that are that not yet exist. And for business people, I think you can see that this this you know 
theory, whatever you want to call it, relies on businesses, right? It's, they are at the core of the development process. But I think it's, um, it's for businesses to realize that employees, their people, are you know, their only um, investment or asset with the potential of unlimited returns. And that your role as businesses is to empower those people to be as productive as possible, share in the upside, and, uh, uh, and be able to improve their lives. And, and for the rest of us, you know, if I go, uh, you know, this is a lens in which we can think about fighting poverty. If I think of going back to the Ayoreans, when I came into that, uh, um, to that tribe, I was very idealistic. I wanted them to stay the same. I wanted them to maintain their cultural heritage and to continue to be hunters and gatherers and the world to change for them. And that was not an option. You know, globalization is happening. And the question is whether we can give people, as we think of all the different initiatives, the expertise um, to improve their lives and to connect them to these networks of opportunities that allows them to have, uh, you know, to have, uh, uh, to be able to improve their own, their own lives. Thank you. Yes.